I just got a note from Pat. He's having some uh, technological challenges, so um, Commissioner Camuso is going to step in and chair the meeting until Pat can return. Morning, everyone. <laughs> Let me just get myself set up. I'm so confused. Sarah, um, I'm trying to get myself set up here. Is everyone here? Sarah, can you can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, I can hear yes, you. Too. I can hear you. Yeah. Sorry, okay. I was muted. Yeah. Yeah. We no, have sorry. a we have a quorum, Judy, and we can start whenever you're ready. Roger will be joining us late. All right, great. So let's go ahead and get started. And we want to start with introductions that would be helpful i can't see who is um on so it'd be helpful if we could do just a um, quick roll call to see who's here great so i'll go ahead and get started um judy camuso commissioner of maine fish and wildlife um, and i will pass it to uh, I don't actually see who's here. You said the light in my office is terrible right now. Um, Amanda. Good morning, Amanda Beal, Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. And should I just pass it to somebody else or do you that want to? Great. No, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> great. How about to Barbara? Uh, good morning. I'm Barbara Trafton. I'm a public member from Brunswick. And maybe Don. Oh, Bob. <laughs> oh, good morning. I'm Bob Myers. I'm public member from Bath. And I'll head it over to Don Kleiner. Don Kleiner, public member from Union. Catherine. Good morning. Catherine Robbins Halstead, public member from Searsmont. And I will toss it over to James. Uh, that's Jim, okay? Uh, <laughs> Jim, Jim Norris, pub, public member from Winthrop. And I believe that is all. I know um, Pat is going to reconnect when he can, and Roger will join probably in the next 10 minutes. Uh, I just want to let everyone know we are recording at this point. Um, so just be aware that this is being recorded and the recording will be used for the purposes of the minutes. I think we can jump right into the agenda. Sorry, so I think the first thing on the agenda is the minutes. So um, I look for a motion to approve the minutes. And so just so moved. folks know, your your paper agenda said um, September and October, but we actually still need to adopt the July minutes as well. And all of those were sent out to you. Um, I do know that Jim Norris noted a couple of um, typos or word missings and he's going to email that to me and we will get those updated and posted to the website once you approve them. Madam Chair, would you like a motion for all three together or would you like them separately? Uh, I'm, I'd be happy to entertain a motion for all three at once. Okay, I move that we accept the minutes for all three of those meetings. I second I that. Anyone in opposition to the motion? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everyone. And now I think I'm going to pass it to you, Sarah, to talk about fund balances. Yep. Um, Judy, just as a reminder, because we are working under our remote meeting policy, if we're going to take a vote, we have to do a roll call. If there okay. is consensus, we can just note that there is consensus. And we're okay. all just going to do our best to <laughs> remember those rules and we'll figure it out. <laughs> all right, thank you. 
Um, so I, I've got a, got this broken up into two different slides. This first slide is the bonds, and you can see um, we have nearly expended the 2009 bond with about 2.5 million remaining in the 2011 bond for a total of 2.8 million. When we come back after the new year in January, you'll see um, some significant changes to these to these numbers. Uh, we've had just a tremendous number of closings in the last couple of months, and these numbers are um, as of the end of October, and therefore don't reflect all of the activity for November and December. So you'll continue to see these numbers go down. The next slide is the uh, budget allocation. Um, so you can see we have um, 40 million dollars here. N none of that money has been drawn down or spent at this point in time. Any questions before I move on to the project allocations? <clears throat> OK, uh, project allocations, you can see we have six active projects with uh, just under a million dollars allocated to those projects. As I mentioned previously, we were able to close on and when I say we, I mean staff. <laughs> staff have been doing just a tremendous amount of work um, burning through these projects and, and getting them closed out. North Falmouth Conservation Corridor, this it was a round eight project so this project has been lingering for quite some time laura has just done phenomenal work in getting this project untangled um, from the various title issues and matching fund issues to a closing um, that we're very happy to celebrate she also worked through caterpillar hill which also had some challenging title um, issues and got that one closed out Pond Cove Island, Cislodopsis, and I'm so happy to say Oakland to Emden Rail Trail also closed just last week. Um, so a tremendous amount of work. The projects that we have remaining are Schooner Cove, Egamogan Reach, not West Keg, <laughs> but the St. George River water access project, Mary Meeting Bay Park, uh, Carter's Wharf, which is a working waterfront project, as well as Henry's Point working waterfront project. So lots of progress, still some more work to do. Um, we hope to have Schooner Cove um, closing out, if not by the end of the year, very early in the next year. And I think that will round out all of the projects selected by the board in 2017 as part of round nine, which will be wonderful. Any questions there? OK, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, and this is the Mary Meeting Park project. Laura is going to present um, just a little update about the project and then the appraisal oversight committee's uh, action since the last time we've met. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. And this is, as you may recall, a truly multi-resource project. Um, Sarah, if you'd switch the si slides, go to the next slide, please. Oh, yes, here it is from the air um, uh, access. This illustrates very nicely the access points. If you see the little stars start and end, those are the beginning and ends of the existing pedestrian and bike paths um, at the, in the town of Brunswick. Those are where the parking is located, one on Grover Lane and one on Water Street. Um, and you can see the Driscoll Islands there in green. And our project outlined in the orange, the two parcels for the two Orm Ormsby parcels outlined in orange. Um, next slide, please. It is 42 and a half acres along the Androscoggin. The town is contributing those Driscoll Islands, 77 acres, give or take, and they do have an appraised value now of 177.5. 
Um, it has, this is truly a multi-resource parcel with fishing grounds, with archeological significance and a potential marsh migration site. The town is going to pre-acquire this parcel. Uh, this is gonna be what they're need, gonna need to do uh, prior to completing their due diligence. They understand the, the risks they run in doing so. And their designated state agent, the Bureau of Parks and Lands is fully in support of this pre-acquisition. Next slide, please. The AOC met on November 16th and to discuss, they accepted the appraised value of $495,000 without reservations. Next slide, please. And so we have a draft motion to approve the recommendation of the LMF Appraisal Oversight Committee and accept the appraiser's value of $495,000. I guess I will make that motion to approve the recommendation of the LMF Appraisal Oversight Committee and accept the appraiser's value of $495,000. And I will second that. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Not seeing any. Um, Sarah, can we do raise our hands or do we have to do an actual roll call? Um, I think we need to do a roll call in terms of recording it for the meeting. Okay. Um, sure. Okay, so I'll just, I'll, I'll start Bob Breyer. Yes. Barbara. Yes. Commissioner Veal. Yes. Dawn. Dawn Kleiner. You're me. Done. I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes. James? Jim? Yes. Catherine? Yes. And have I missed anyone, Sarah? Oh, other than Commissioner Kelleher's not here. No, I'm, uh, I'm back. Oh, you're back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I well, At least for now, I'm back. Uh, my, I vote yes. All right. I think we want to check to see if Roger has joined us at this point. Okay. Roger, if you're here, speak up. I don't see him on the list. Oh. OK, so um, the motion carries unanimously uh, with all members here except for Roger. And um, Commissioner Kelleher, do you want to just introduce yourself and I will pass over the meeting to you? Yeah, thank you very much, Judy. Um, it's Pat Kelleher, Commissioner at the Department of Marine Resources and Chair of LMF. Um, I am very sorry about my connection here this morning, and if it ha if it happens again, uh, I'll, um, I'll I'll just stay in the background. And, and Judy, have you continue if you don't mind? Um, that brings us to uh, the second part of uh, Agenda uh, Item Number Five, which is Egamogan Reach. And so I'll turn it back over to staff. Uh, actually, we have to finish. Oh, so. oh, what do we got? I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> jumping in. The public notice and to get the funds actually approved for this project. Uh, OK, thank you. I, um, so uh, there was an announcement of a public notice. The public notice for the Mary Meeting Park uh, project was advertised in the Kennebec Journal and Portland Press Herald on November 19th, and no comments were received. That's correct. Next slide, please, Sarah. So we have draft motion number two to confirm the allocation of 247.5 and LMF water access funding to support the acquisition of the Ormsby parcel for the Mary Meeting Park water access project subject to standard conditions. And here is where I want to note that standard <coughs> conditions will include the requirement that the limiting language of the utility easement held by CMP must be expanded to include the right of the public to cross and recross this. Currently, there isn't a right existing for agricultural uses to cross and recross, but I don't think we're going to make our public members farm in order to walk across the land. So that is understood to be part of the standard conditions and part of the title, and the town understands that. And I'll Great. move the motion as stated. We have a motion by Barbara. Do we have a second? I'll second, second. it. Second by Bob Myers. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? 
So uh, I'm going to read into the record. The motion uh, is to confirm the allocation of 274, two, excuse me, $247,500 in LMF water access funding to support the acquisition of the Ormsby parcels for the Merry Meeting Park water access project, subject to the standard conditions that were just described by Laura. Um, uh, if is there any other uh, any other comments? Is there any objections to this? There are no objections. With no objections, it is clear that the uh, the boards is voting. All the board members present are voting in the affirmative, so the record will re reflect that clearly um, as a unanimous vote. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'll move on to Agamogan Reach. OK, thank you. So Eggamog and Reach uh, and Mill Pond came to LMF last year and we, the board did a final allocation uh, on May uh, 2020. This was proposed as a, as a project with two parcels. There is a parcel on the shore of Eggamog and Reach that would be acquired with LMF funds, purchase and fee and also a um, donated conservation easement on the mill pond parcel, which would be a match parcel. Uh, unfortunately, when the applicant got into the title work, they discovered that the land underlying mill pond was actually owned by a neighbor. And because this is not a great pond, that that is re that becomes relevant in terms of securing public access to the standard that LMF would need to see. So um, after some discussion between um, us and Blue Hill Heritage Trust, the applicant, we decided that the way to go forward with this, uh, with the board's approval, would be to remove that mill pond parcel from the LMF project. Uh, they would continue with the pro with acquiring the easement. Um, and probably even close it at the same time. But because of that title issue, uh, LMF's requirements for the clarity of public access would be a burden that would be pretty hard to overcome. So on the next slide, um, the breakdown of how this would affect LMF's um, award here. And what you see here is that the mill pond parcel, like I said, was just matched. It was a relatively small amount and it wasn't strictly required. So the impact of this financially would be that we would lose that 28.5 as match. Um, but there would be no change in the LMF award and the uh, project as a whole would still have sufficient match just from the um, other half of the Acquisition cost on that shoreline. So, um, Barbara, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, Jason, uh, so you said that uh, they would proceed with an easement on for access to Mill Pond, uh, but it wouldn't be up to the standards required by LMF. But I wondered from the public's perspective, uh, will that access look different? As a practical matter, it'll be, it'll be the same access. The, you know, it's a really murky area where the these landowners that we're work, we've been working with own everything around and right up to the shore of Mill Pond, and then somebody else owns the actual dam and the land underneath the pond. And just in terms of requirement you know, to provide, you know, legal public access to all of our projects that raised some real questions. But meanwhile, the neighboring owners who own that land are friendly and. You know, in all likelihood, it looks exactly the same on the ground and for the for members of the public accessing the property. Thank you. So any on the other questions, any other questions for Bob? But Bob, just can we go back to the map real quick? I'm not sure if that it, the way you just described that it almost made it sound like this land was this project was landlocked, but that's not the case, correct? 
Um, what do you mean by landlocked? You mean that they're people in order to access the property, you have to cross private property. That's true too. There is um, a right of way that the the abutting owner would be. Oh, actually, the, the these the sellers own out to the road, so they would grant a right of way across their property okay. uh, with that. And and the um, the shore parcel is not landlocked. There's a there's a public road that runs runs to it. Okay. Okay. Great. So that's that piece. The LMS going to stay involved with. There's no no access issues at all. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate that clarity. Jim. Uh, yeah. Is there ongoing efforts to by the local trust to uh, perhaps acquire title to the dam and to the underlying water? Yes, uh, but okay. the you know the abutting owners just have have no urgency, and it's it's unclear what that would okay. look like and how it would work. Uh, so just right. uh, just keep this project moving forward. That was yep. that was the reason for taking the LMF out of that piece of it. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions for Jason? Seeing none, carry on. All right, so we have a draft motion for the board to approve the reconfiguration of this project by removing the mill pond match parcel. Mr. Chair, I move we approve the reconfiguration of this project and the mill pond project by removing the mill pond match parcel. And I will second, I second that motion. We have a motion by Don Kleiner and a second, I believe, by Jim Norris, uh, if I heard that correctly. Um, is there any other questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, is there any objections to the motion? Because we have no objections, it is clear that those board members present are voting in the affirmative. The motion passes and the record will <laughs> reflect that clearly. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the last item, I believe, under item number five, which is the Tibbetts Farm in Berwick. And before Jason jumps into this, I think Roger has joined us. If we could just have Roger quickly introduce yourself. Yes, <clears throat> this is Roger Burley. I'm a public member of the LMF board, and it's nice to hear you on the radio this morning, Sarah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good to know. I wasn't aware. <laughs> yes, main public. Very Heard good. You twice in, in the six o'clock hour and the eight o'clock hour. Very good. I had a nice conversation with Kevin Miller, so that's good to know it has gone to air. And also, with Beth Hearn was on the same interview, and she's also one of my favorite uh, people in in uh, in Augusta. Great. Well, welcome, uh, welcome, Roger. Sorry about the confusion and having you have to turn around. Um, uh, just for the board's sake, uh, I can tell you that Sarah worked diligently to try to get the system up and running yesterday uh, and was uh, foiled um, and I'm afraid didn't receive the help she needed from OIT, not for the lack of trying, though. Um, so hopefully we'll get those uh, technical glitches um, solved for the future for future meetings. So that I'm going to turn it back over to staff to describe the Tibbetts farm and we do this is an action item. Thank you. Pat. <clears throat> um, so Tibbetts farm is a farmland project in uh, Berwick that closed in 2005 and it's two parcels uh, with conservation easements on them. They're across, from, across the road from each other and they are held by Great Works Regional Land Trust and their stewardship staff discovered that the acreage as described in the easement and the project agreement is wrong on both parcels. And the reason for that is the difference between 72 acres plus a five acre building envelope and 72 acres including a five acre building envelope. Uh, so the point, and it's the, and so in the, in the part, you know, the, basically the start of the document where it says, you know, being, you know, this project is 72 acres. It's, or it's it says 72, it should say 77. And the other one should say 102, it says 97. But the legal description 
of the easement area is entirely correct. It's just that that recitation of the acreage. And just to be completely safe while everybody is still on board and willing to do it. Um, Great Works is, is proposing to record some type of corrective document and we're going to need to work with all of the attorneys to figure out exactly what that looks like uh, to correct that acreage. And that'll need signatures from the board chair and the commissioner, uh, the same as the original documents did. But there's no substantive change to the easement. There's no change to the area that's protected. This is a administrative correction. Um, so next slide. Right. So there's a map. You can see the two parcels there. But we have a draft motion to for the board to authorize a uh, correction. To the Tibbetts Farm easement and the project agreement with LMS staff to work with council to make sure that it's in the correct form. Great, thank you, Jason. Uh, we've got some questions, Jim Norris. Uh, actually, I was just raising my hand to request permission to make a motion. Uh, feel free. We can deal with questions after the motions are made. I move that we authorize a correction to the Tibbetts Farm easement and project agreement. LMF staff to work with the council to determine the form. And I second the motion. Motion by Jim North, second by Roger Burley. Um, any questions on uh, this work or in this motion? I'm not seeing any questions. Um, are there any? Is there any opposition to the motion? I'm going to read into the record. The motion is to authorize a correction to the Tibbetts Farm easement and project agreement. LMS staff to work with council to determine the form. Um, again, is there any opposition? Seeing no opposition, uh, the motion passes with uh, unanimous consent of all those board members present. Uh, and the record will clearly reflect that uh, in the minutes. So thank you very much. I, I do want to point out that, uh, you know, we, we talk about the due diligence all the time uh, with these projects, but here are the last two projects in particular is, is a, a great case in points of how the due diligence um, finds these type of problems so we can make these type of uh, very important corrections. So uh, good work from, from uh, all those involved on those projects. So thank you very much. And that moves us along to item number six, which is the LMF call for proposal. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Great. Um, so we did have um, a deadline um, for inquiry forms for our um, round A of round 10. And that that first um, very quick round, as you'll recall, was for projects of statewide significance only. Uh, we did receive seven inquiry forms. Two were from state agencies, two were from land trusts, and one was from a town. The projects um, in, were located in Oxford, Franklin, and Aroostook County, with Franklin having the greatest showing of four of the seven projects, two in Aroostook, one in Oxford. Um, we Of those seven, five of them were fee, acquisitions one was a conservation easement and one project includes both fee and easement <clears throat> two of the projects are deer wintering area projects and um, the project area estimates um, uh, is about 18,088 acres we do know that um, of those seven inquiry forms it is quite possible that not all of them will turn into proposals um, we've heard from IFNW that one of theirs, um, they're looking to potentially push to the later application process, still still coming in as an application, just on a slower track. Um, so we know that, that that can happen between now and the submission date of December 30th. But, um, you know, a decent showing of seven, seven projects in a very short, you know, folks had six weeks essentially um, to to get this all figured out and um, so anything we get at this point is is welcome and um, we're looking forward to working with these applicants to 
get their projects or proposals finalized. So the board will be um, receiving the applications as early in January as we can get them to you. Knowing that you will be going through your scoring process and selection process at the January 25th board meeting. And I'm happy to take any questions. Bob retracted. Eric, just so I understand this, if if one of the projects uh, does not move forward and get in the proposal by December 30th, they can roll into the community and recreation call for proposals and have their proposal in in that timeline instead. Is that what you were suggesting? That's correct. That that second um, application. Uh, deadline is for projects both of statewide significance and community conservation projects. So absolutely, if a project just decides they just it don't don't have enough time or don't have enough um, you know information to put together a, a really strong proposal and they want to push that off, that's absolutely fine. Any other questions for Sarah? Seeing none, why don't we continue on, Sarah? Great, so the next part of our meeting, we're going to do uh, brief overviews for the board on the Working Farmland Access Protection Program and the Working Waterfront Access Protection Program. At your next meeting in January, you will be adopting the workbooks for these pro programs and issuing a call for proposals. So we thought it would be useful to just do kind of a high level overview to start you thinking about each of these programs and how they're going to work. What's the board's role? What are the agency's roles in each of these programs? They are different than our typical statewide significant and community conservation call for proposals. Um, and so with that, I'm going to start out with the Working Farmland Access Protection Program overview, and um, that's going to be provided by Alex Redfield, who um, has been hired by the Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources, and Jason Boulay here from LMF. Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to be with you this morning. Uh, again, I'm Alex. I joined the Bureau in late September and have lurked at your last few meetings, but haven't introduced myself in person yet. Maybe someday we'll make it happen. Um, so quickly wanted to provide an, uh, yeah, as Sarah said, a general overview of where we're at in drawing up the first cycle of implementation of the Working Farmland Access and Protection Program. Um, you adopted a timeline and the workbook sort of bones are in statute and we'll talk a little bit about what that timeline uh, means for the other elements and tasks in drafting this program and getting the call for proposals out um, and Jason will touch briefly on what LMF staff is working on in the meantime as we bulk things out in the bureau and we'll talk a little bit about board <clears throat> responsibilities too. Um, I will say that I wasn't thinking in the slide construction, so I put in some little animation things to bring the text along one by one. So maybe a pain, Sarah, but uh, sorry, we'll figure it out. I've learned my lesson. Um, so can we go to the next slide? Um, great. So the like I said, the board adopted a timeline of the program in general, and we just wanted to add some of the sort of internal steps that are happening at the bureau level um, between now and when the LMF board sees proposals. Um, so right now, Jason is working on revising the last iteration of the workbook. We've been going back and forth. Um, taking the criteria, scoring criteria that are codified in statute and building them into uh, working farmland workbook. You should see that before you for adoption in January. Um, the, the major difference um, this cycle versus previous cycles is that there will be a lot more work sort of happening at the bureau level before it gets to the LMF board. So similar to Parks and Lands and IFNW, 
Um, inquiry forms will go straight to the Bureau and different from previous run throughs, there will be an internal scoring process at the Bureau. So um, we'll have inquiry forms, a site visit, um, similar to how Parks and Lands and IFNW sort of assess readiness. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, that will happen in the spring, full proposals to the Bureau in June, um, the internal scoring work done in August, um, with the commissioner reviewing and advancing proposals to the LMF board in advance of the September meeting. Um, thank you. Yeah, you may just have to click through a little bit. Great. So I guess I already said this, jump the gun, but the, the goal here is to um, really build up that relationship between the applicant and the bureau directly with LMF staff both guidance and engagement throughout the process so that when we do get applicants ready to go, we know that their proposals are in line with what we want to do, both as LMF and as the Bureau. Um, and again, really stole these steps from um, Liz and Bethany at the other designating sponsoring agencies here. So trying to model their work um, prior to full submissions. Um, the major, one of the major steps um, that we haven't sort of finalized yet is building out the review panel. Um, so again, the scoring of the project is happening at the Bureau of Agriculture um, and the commissioner will have to appoint those members. We haven't selected people, but you'll notice right down at the very bottom we're hoping to find an LMF board representative to sit on that board to make sure that there is compatibility and the board uh, is fully aware of everything that's happening at the first round of scoring um, process. So won't put anybody on the spot right now, but if anyone is passionate about joining the Bureau of Agriculture in this first round of application reviews, we'd like to hear more and would love to see a representative on the review panel. Um, that's it for me, I, unless folks have questions about what happens between now and when things get to um, LMF board again for review. Uh, about a draft. Uh, Alex, uh, is there a, a plan to sort of market this new opportunity to uh, people in the agricultural community? Definitely, and it could, could stand a little more uh, energy and resources at the at this point. Right now, we wanted to put all of our time into making sure those rules and program guidelines could be public as soon as possible. I've done some preliminary outreach to the land trust community and to the farmland trusts to get their feedback on past farmland protection projects so we can incorporate their thoughts into this workbook draft and also to sort of gauge how many proposals are out there and ready for the call. Um, so sort of a combination of outreach to the active agricultural community with farmers directly through service providers and other networks we're a part of and the land trust community, which may be a little more familiar with LMF, but this is kind of a new opportunity. So I want to make sure folks are looped in. Thank you. Any other questions on farmland? Seeing no others, I think you're off the hook for now, uh, and we'll start on working waterfront. Uh, almost, Jason oh, has a oh, little. Oh, you got more! Too. Holy smoke! Sorry about that. No, thank you. Uh, so, because this is a new a new program, and it's different from the way that LMF has funded farmland projects in the past, uh, I just wanted to take a minute and run down the sort of role and responsibilities of LMF staff and the LMF board uh, in making these awards. So what I'm doing right now is working with Alex. Uh, I say I should say myself, Sarah and Laura are working with Alex and uh, Bureau staff to uh, develop that workbook and uh, e the scoring criteria, the easement template and all those all those rules to make sure that they are compatible with what LMF does and our, our standard conditions. Uh, when that goes out and 
uh, we start seeing letters of inquiry and later project proposals. Uh, we'll be working with Alex and providing some assistance in reviewing those. Um, looking at making sure that again that they're going to be able to comply with LMF standard conditions. There aren't any red flags. You know, we LMF staff are not looking so much at it. You know, is this a viable farm? Is this productive farmland? That's you know the Bureau's area of expertise. We're looking more at the process. And once those projects have been those have been approved, the awards have been made, then same as any other project will work with the applicant to uh, work through all the due diligence and complete complete the project uh, under the LMF conditions. Next slide, sir. Oh, sorry, Jim, do you have your hand up? Yeah, yes. Um, I just was hoping that as this time period lapses through that there might be some updates, email updates or otherwise, so the board has a sense of how things are going. In terms of. Um, well, well, it I looks like I, because it's new, um, you're going to be making some important decisions and uh, interim decisions before we end up getting involved down the road. And I guess it's only natural that you would keep us updated, but um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that 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 process occurs, you know, so that we know if you've run into any serious difficulties uh, uh, or, you know, how successful the process has been. I, I'm sorry, Jim, are you referring to the process of developing the workbook or the process or the actual project intake and review process? Developing the workbook. Yeah, so the, where that is now is we are, we're working through it. I think most of it in terms of the. Um, you know, the, the process. And the conditions are going to be very, very similar to. That work with it, work with it was just approved in October. Uh, and certainly that'll we'll get that to the board as soon as possible, you know, in advance of that January meeting. Uh, for approval. Thank you. Jim, I would just add a lot of this new workbook. Um, not only will it be similar to, um, you know, LMF board policies and and um, requirements for for conservation and recreation projects, but um, a lot of the agriculture specific um, requirements will be similar to what the Bureau and, and LMF has used in the past as well. Um, you might recall that prior to round nine, there was a whole separate component of the workbook aimed specifically at farmland. Um, we've used that as a jumping off place in developing this new workbook. So it, it should all look relatively familiar. I think the, the big changes will be in the scoring and how the Bureau wants to um, sort of set its priorities, as well as any changes in law that were made. Thank you. Barbara. Uh, Jason, I uh, continue to be interested in uh, whether there are potential applicants out there and whether they are going to be fully apprised of uh, the structure and the process. And, you know, I recall that MCHT had done a survey uh, and sort of uh, come up with a potential number of applicants waiting in the wings. And so I'm, I know that we've had money left over from um, in, in the agricultural uh, uh, allocations in the past, and so I'm I'm just wondering if we have any sense of um, potential applicants uh, getting ready to, you know, enter into this process. Maybe Commissioner Beal has a sense of that. I don't know, but I, I I appreciate all the work going into the process. I'm still concerned that every everyone in the agricultural community is following this and getting ready, um, you know, to enter into a application if, if 
if they're ready to do so. I could speak to that briefly. That that survey that went out from MCHT and the Land Trust Network was a survey that I made and sent out. So trying to <laughs> get trying to get a handle on what's out there in terms of potential applications. Not a lot of feedback from the survey. It was buried in the newsletter, and I'm going to try to push it out a little bit more. But the feedback that we did get both from uh, from Maine Farmland Trust and another land trust is that they really need to see the rules before they decide if they're ready to go ahead right now. So that's sort of underlined the importance of getting the workbook done and out there so folks can assess whether they're ready to apply now or need some more time for years two through four of the funding. Thank you, Alex. Sure. All right. Um, so just a brief rundown of what the board can expect to see at you know through this process. Um, you know, because this is a new statutory structure, the process, the board, the process for the board is going to look a little, little bit different than farmland projects in the past. Um, hopefully, more similar to the way that the board has uh, been involved with the working waterfront projects. That was the general model that we were aiming at, anyway. Uh, so the board is still responsible for adopting the, the policies, the workbook, uh, and the scoring criteria for this for this uh, program. And as Alex just said, uh, we would love for the a board member to be represented on that review panel, but that's not something that's in statute. It's not a requirement. Ultimately, the composition of that panel is at the discretion of Commissioner Beal. But um, certainly it would be great if there were a board member on it. Uh, and then when the pro when the proposals come in, as Alex said, they're going to go to the Bureau, they're going to go to that review panel, and that review panel is going to uh, give the board then the scoring and rec and funding recommendations for those proposals. And then it will be up to the board to make uh, the preliminary awards. Uh, as with any other project, the board can set special conditions on things that might need to be accomplished to uh, meet the purposes of the program. And from there, it tracks just like any other project uh, that staff will work with applicants to get the appraisal, start due diligence, and the board will then uh, get updates on it. On, on progress and when the appraisal comes in, we'll approve that and make the final award. Like so from once that everything after that preliminary award, like I said, it tracks it'll track just like any other LMF project. The the big changes in the in that scoring by the review panel. Questions about any of that? Seeing none. Thank okay. you. Or before I say we're going to work in waterfront, am I missing anything else? <laughs> I think we're done. Oh, Thank you. Oh, good. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. We'll go over to working waterfront, which is a uh, which is the model for which the farmland pro um, um, uh, process was built on. So, and we'll start with Deirdre. Similar process. We'll start with Deirdre, and then Laura will kind of fill in as well. So Deirdre, uh, I hope you're here. <laughs> I am here, Sarah. Uh, and thank you very much. I'm Deirdre Gilbert. I'm at the Department of Marine Resources. I'm the Director of State Marine Policy. Um, and I just wanted to, get, again, give you some of the background on the Working Waterfront Access Protection Program. If you want to go to the next slide. Uh, just as a reminder for folks who don't think about commercial fishing all the time like we do, um, there's significant value from Maine's commercial fisheries, uh, particularly obviously in coastal communities. In 2020, the landed value of all of Maine's commercial fishing was $517 million. That was actually down significantly due to the pandemic. Um, and we've actually seen significantly increased value in 2021. So we do anticipate it will be quite a bit higher this year by the time the year ends. Um, we've done some studies to look at the value of commercial fishing beyond the actual landed value. 
Um, and in lobster, at least, there was another one and a half billion dollars of economic activity after that lobster gets landed. And an estimate of the number of jobs that commercial fishing supports is around 35,000. So commercial fishing is somewhat unique in that we can only access that value if there are places for people to keep and access their vessels and land their catch. And so that's obviously the purpose of this program is to ensure that that um, remains available. So the, the formal statement about the purpose of the program is that it provides protection to strategically significant working waterfront properties whose continued availability to commercial fishing businesses is essential to the long-term future of this economic sector. Next slide. Um, what the program does, similar to other uh, conservation programs, is it secures both a working waterfront covenant and a right of first refusal the Department of Marine Resources holds both of those instruments at the end of this process. So again, that provides permanent protection. It also ensures um, affordability of commercial fishing properties in the future should those properties change hands. Um, if a property is sold, it's there is an appraisal that's done at that time and the purchase price can't exceed the commercial fishing value of the property which is obviously particularly important for coastal properties and remaining um, affordable. Uh, next slide. And again, just because this is a little bit different than your other programs, um, the structure of the Working Waterfront Access Protection Program is a partnership between DMR and DACF, and the Land for Maine's Future Program. Um, similar to what farmland will be creating we have a review panel that actually scores the proposals that we receive um, there's kind of a diverse expertise on that panel of fishermen realtors lenders folks with just extensive knowledge of the main coast um, so that group of folks actually receives the proposals um, scores them according to the criteria in the workbook and then makes a recommendation to the commissioner who brings those recommendations to the LMF board to actually get the funding allocated. And then obviously, like your other projects, post funding, the projects go through the due diligence steps, which I think Laura will speak to. Um, next slide. I just want to add, Deirdre, here that, um, and maybe you're going to do this later. I'm sorry to jump in. Uh, your review panel has included Roger Burley, so he's a um, good one to continue in terms of LMF board engagement. Yes, the commissioner and I were, were talking about that. Um, Roger has actually been a member of the review panel since the onset of the program. He has served for every round, and so it would be great if he would continue in his capacity as an LMF board member. Right now. I would I would jump at the opportunity. Thank you, Deirdre and um, Sarah. And just to give you an idea, um, similar again to farmland, the, the fact that there are scoring criteria are they are listed in statute as you know, these are the things that need to be included, but they're not a comprehensive list. So for the life of the program, these scoring criteria have been fairly con uh, consistent. The top um, five criteria have been the same since we started. In the last couple of rounds, we added the capacity for new shoreside jobs. So that's kind of the newest criteria. Um, other than that, these have remained relatively uh, consistent. Um, and I think that is all I had for, oh, sorry, just to give you an idea of what has happened in the life of the program. Um, again, this started in 2006, and this represents, I think, a pretty comprehensive map of our existing properties. Um, there are a couple in progress, as Sarah mentioned at the very beginning, one in Booth Bay Harbor and one in Jonesport that haven't closed from the last round. Um, we anticipate, I think Sarah kind of covered this a little bit, but we would go out um, to solicit 
letter. Uh, I guess you'll you'll approve the workbook in January. We will solicit letters of interest in February and then proceed with the application process from there. Um, the letters of interest are relatively recent addition. We just started doing that in the last round to try to get a better look at properties before we have somebody go through the full proposal development process. The staff person here who will administer this program will be a new staff person that has just been hired by the Maine Coastal Program who will start early in the new year. And then we also intend to contract for additional outside services to help do that project development work over the spring and then bring uh, these proposals to you, I think, in the fall for approval. Yeah, and, and just to note the one of the significant differences, one of the many significant differences with working waterfront is that we have landowners applying directly to the program as opposed to a land trust or a third party who's um, going to hold the interest. With, with working waterfronts, DMR holds the interest. That's the covenant in the right of first refusal. And so that contracted service is really helpful to those landowners in helping them pull together the information they need for a proposal. Uh, and I Robert also want to note on this on this map for folks, these are the towns. <laughs> so the working waterfront covenant is located in the town. These are typically very small, you know, a quarter of an acre kind of kind of sized projects, um, half an acre, a, a tenth of an acre, you know, very small. So the town is what's highlighted. Robert Jack. Uh, Deidre, I in the scoring criteria, I can see that obviously the economics of a project uh, rise to the top. But within those categories, is there also consideration for the conservation values of a project and how that plays into the economic value? Um, I'm trying to, could you explain a little bit more the, what you have in mind with conservation values? Well, one of the first projects that uh, you know surfaced when I was on the board was the Jonesport, and with sea level rise, uh, you know that project is going to need to move at some point, and so potentially if a project had room to uh, change, and the land was large enough so that it could accommodate, you know, sea rise might be a conservation value or. I guess a conservation value might be it's in an area where the stock is very plentiful so that it's not, uh, you know, the fishermen coming in or are working in an area that can accommodate a lot of landings of stock. Um, so I'm just wondering if or or seagrass, for example, you know, is it in an area that, uh, you know, won't be disturbing, uh, you know, important beds of seagrass, which also you know, are important for, you know, uh, forage fish and other things that su support a robust stock. Um, so maybe that's not even considered in this. I just wondered. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think some of the criteria do indirectly get it. Some of the examples that you've raised, for example, the landings themselves tend to reflect, you know, what is available to fishermen to catch in that area. The utility of the property, I think some of the sea level rise questions could an applicant could bring those things up in the utility of the property, kind of showing how that property will remain viable going forward. Um, the seagrass, we, we have had less conversations about kind of those more um, indirect uh, considerations of, uh, of the utility of a property. And I've just put us back to this slide that talks about the purpose of the Working Waterfront Access Protection Program. And, I, and I'm guessing, Deirdre, this much of this language is based in statute. Is that essentially where you pulled this from? And you can see that the focus of this really is about um, access to the water, getting getting to the water and getting your catch off the water to land. Um, and much less about the traditional conservation values that Barbara is talking about. Um, in the last 
round, we did provide the board with some maps to understand um, the parcels sort of uh, position and significance to things like sea level rise, um, flood hazard mitigation. So I think um, as we continue with this program, we are going to want to be thinking about um, how does the how resilient is the property and what are the sort of engineering challenges or opportunities that are going to be presented by the property and um, in my experience that's something that's very much on these property owners minds they're they're thinking about um, and seeing the effects of a king tide and what that means for them and and it's very much in the forefront of their of their consideration in the ownership and management of that property Thank you, Sarah. And I, I would just say you've expressed very well my concern that, you know, really conservation values underlies economic value um, and that they can't be separated. Uh, so they're looked at perhaps in different ways, but they're very much a part of the value of any working waterfront. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, Deidre, are you wrapped up and ready to hand it over to Laura? Yep, if there are no other questions, Laura will cover the LMF side of the program. I will cover the LMF. Thank you, Deirdre. And there's not a whole lot more for me to say. You'll be so disappointed to hear me say this. Um, uh, yes, I look forward to working with my eventual new counterpart at DMR to help in any way they would like me to help in, in the revisions to this next workbook. We don't expect there to be very many. Um, and then, yes, this will be me working directly. As Sarah said, one of the things I love about the program is I get to work directly with the fishermen, whether it's a co-op or an individual family. Um, that's who I work with to help them uh, complete their due diligence requirements. Um, and we're all pretty familiar with that process. Um, I don't think there's much else for me to say. Sarah, have I left anything out that you're hoping I would cover? I think just um, it's important for the board to understand um, sort of their relationship with the project in that they are still reviewing appraisals, approving appraisals. They're still um, voting to allocate the funds um, that, that that part doesn't change for the board. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. Due diligence looks like due diligence and that's still that's still your job. That's still your job. Uh, exactly. If there are any questions. I don't have a question, Laura, but just a comment um, for the board. My, I've been around the Working Waterfront program for quite a while now um, and, and seeing the value of this firsthand. Um, you know, the snapshots that you're seeing here on the screen now um, certainly are um, representative of what we are trying to protect. Very, as Sarah said earlier, very small parcels of land that provide that um, that access and you know we're we're buying something the state is buying a covenant um, and I I think what we're seeing though when we're buying this covenant is the money almost always going back into these facilities you know the, the lower left hand corner um, uh, down at Harpswell um, you know adding solar uh, and and making that facility a little bit more green um, you know, we're seeing um, extensions of piers um, like we've seen down at Tenants Harbor, those type of things. And I think, to Sarah, do you, I mean, uh, excuse me, to Barbara, to your point about kind of the, the conservation values, whenever any time of that work is done to expand on, then the, then the permitting, state permitting process comes into play as well uh, to ensure that the conservation of seagrass, for instance, and in, in the protection of seagrass is not impacted. So there's a lot of that at play. And I know for a, for a fact that sea level rise is very much on the forefront uh, of those who are uh, looking at the future of their facilities and, and how they have to respond. So. Um, you know, some, some don't have to worry about it, but others, I, I, look, I use Port Clyde all the time and you, you see that new cement bulkhead down there that they put in with working water access money years and years ago now. Um, it wasn't a problem when it first happened, but now those big tides will cover that bulkhead um, and you see them wading through the water in order to get there. So those are things that are definitely on the minds of all these property owners and uh, I, I think giving them 
the tool to access money to address some of those issues is really critical for the state. So it's, a, I think, great program, but in a high priority for the Department of Marine Resources. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop rambling and uh, we've got some subcommittee updates. Yes, I thought it'd be helpful for folks to just see um, the progress that we are making. Um, the Jason convened the workbook committee on November 10th, um, and we expect that there will be uh, another follow up meeting scheduled. Uh, the appraisal committee, Laura is convening that group on December 9th, and um, I will be convening the budget and finance um, group also on December 9th. And then um, making progress in looking at some of the board policy discussions. Um, I've had a chance to connect with the commissioners and um, sort of feel out some of those topics and, and um, how we're going to approach those. I will be following up with those of you who indicated an interest in um, sort of selecting which projects we focus on first. And my hope is that um, but for our March board meeting, we can have some robust discussions. Um, and with that, I'm going to segue to the calendar. There's a reason why I chose March. <laughs> and when you look at the calendar, you'll see why. Um, so everyone received the 2022 calendar. I did provide an update. There was one um, change to the appraisal oversight committee meeting. So all the board me meetings have stayed the same. If you've put them in your calendar already, no changes to those. Um, what we see in the coming year is uh, a meeting in January where the board will be selecting project finalists. Um, immediately after that, we will have two um, AOC meetings. So any applicant who was selected in January that has their appraisal ready to go can get in line at these March, Fe February and March meetings, which will prime them for the March 22 board meeting for the board to hopefully um, accept those appraised values and out issue a final financial allocation. That's where we'd also be talking because we don't have um, any scoring or project selection happening that month, that's when I'm anticipating we would be talking about board policy topics. Uh, in Then in May, we will likely have a two days of meetings. This is where I'm expecting we will um, have quite a significant number of proposals to review. And the, at the last time we did this, a two day meeting worked really well with the day one being an opportunity for applicants to present on their projects and answer any questions the board might have. And then the second day, the board finalizes their scoring and goes into executive session to um, allocate funding to those finalists. And again, we've um, set up a couple of AOC meetings fo following that May, those May meetings again, so that if any of those applicants have appraisals that are ready to go, we can get them in the queue and get the AOC um, ready so that by the July meeting, the board could allocate a final allocation. And then again in September, the board will be um, selecting the finalists for the working waterfront, uh, working farmland, and working forest easements. So um, we've got a pretty uh, intense schedule of reviewing proposals and selecting projects. And then we have November 29th um, as the final meeting for the board. All of these AOC meetings are intentional to keep our applicants um, projects moving at a pretty fast pace. So we're we're hoping that um, we can prevent any bog downs or delays in getting those appraisals reviewed. And I didn't schedule anything uh, in the month of December intentionally. December is a, typically a very busy time of year in terms of closings. So I wanted to keep some flexibility in the event that we have multiple closings scheduled for December that staff can put their resources towards closing out those projects. Any thoughts or concerns about the 2022 calendar? Great. 
no no thoughts no concerns i think everybody's ready we've got uh, a lot of work ahead of us um with all of the uh applications coming in uh oh we got a hand from jim norris jim yes um <clears throat> i recently saw a um pretty good summary of the cyclodopsis project on um channel six i think it was about a about a week ago fairly early in the morning and was well put together, um, but conspicuously missing to me was any mention of LMF's involvement in the project. Um, I, I don't know that it was particularly, you know, uh, <clears throat> designed to do that, but um, I, I'm concerned not so much that we deserve a pat on the back, but that the public doesn't always realize just how significant um, the program is, um, and I'm kind of hoping that uh, the stakeholders out there um, kind of keep this in mind that uh, we do play an important role, uh, probably a critical role in the success of all these projects. So um, just wanted to share that. And, and again, um, on main public this morning, well, six o'clock and eight o'clock hours. Um, it, it was very brief, but I think anyone who was listening casually might have uh, been a little startled by the forty million dollar number. So uh, there, there, there's one little answer to not so little answer to Jim's concern for anyone who happened to tune in to a main public. So uh, I. You were part of that, Sarah, uh, and as was uh, Beth Hearn. So uh, there's something to, in answer to your concerns, Jim. Thank you. And and I okay. would just, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could add, uh, I saw a newspaper article recently, and I did talk with Sarah about it because, again, it didn't mention uh, the partnership with Land for Maine's future, and so I think. You know, perhaps just as we ask them to display a sign at the site, um, maybe we could give them a one-liner or something that they would include in their press releases uh, just to emphasize this partnership. Because as Jim said, you know, if we ever have to go out for another bond issue, it's really important that the public knows how we're investing their monies. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. It's a those are really good points. And I know, um, you know, for the most part, I think everybody does try to uh, ensure that they're giving LMF credit with their, uh, with their projects. And uh, if we, <laughs> if I've learned something over the last 10 years, it's not always easy to control the press. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but the point's well taken, and um, we should be encouraging the, that type of inclusion in any kind of releases and promotion they're doing in the projects. So I appreciate that. Um, I think we've covered everything, Sarah, but I'm looking to you to see if you've got anything else. I see a head shaking. No, is there any yeah, other? We're, we're good. Is there any other business to be brought before the board? Um, uh, yes, Pat, Roger, uh, I'd just like to uh, say that um, Amanda Beal came to Cliff Island about a month ago and gave an absolutely wonderful talk uh, at our land trust annual meeting, Oceanside Conservation Trust. Uh, she was she was just terrific in, in putting um, the state's conservation protection efforts and in particular the Land for Maine's Future uh, work. Uh, I will send you a link to her talk, Sarah, and you can distribute that uh, as you see fit. But you know, Amanda was wonderful. She gave up her whole Saturday, uh, October 23rd, and we're very grateful and well rewarded uh, with her comments. Well, thank was you. My, my family good to her, Roger? <laughs> well, I think she got a better reception on Cliff than you did, Pat, uh, at, your, <laughs> at, at your lobster meeting. <laughs> Actually, there were none of your relatives uh, showed up that day. I wish they had. Um, no, well, that's too bad. I'll, uh, I'll twist their arm now, next time. <laughs> Okay. Well, it was a beautiful day, very, very well spent. So thank you for the invitation. Yeah, there's no better place to spend a Saturday. So glad you got out there, Amanda. That's great. Um, OK, um, seeing no other hands and no other comments for the board, I think a motion to adjourn is in order.
So Most moved. Turned by Roger Burley, seconded by Don Kleiner, because I can see his mouth getting ready to move. <laughs> uh, motion, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. I got to go stoke this 1960s wood furnace that's sitting behind me because it's only about 90 degrees in my cellar right now. <laughs> Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.